thank you for calling in. Michael and Chris, can you hear us okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. I can't see you. Okay, the, it seems the connection is a little bit fuzzy, but just kind of a debrief for the audience and for you guys. So we can see Michael and Chris, but they can't see us. And when we pass the microphone around during questions, if you can speak uh, clearly into this microphone like this so they can hear us. Were you able to catch that? Michael and Chris? Can you hear us okay? Yes. Just to start off our discussion, um, how did you first learn about Craig Cobb and what was happening in Leith? Uh, uh, we just read a, a newspaper article in the New York Times that uh, was basically a photo essay of all the people in the town and how they were responding to what Cobb was trying to do. It's been outed by the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center um, as being a white supremacist with a plan to take over the town. So. Once, I, once we read that in the newspaper, we started following the story uh, to see if it was something that we wanted to pursue. And when you approached Cobb to, to speak to him about being in the film and also using um, his and Dutton's footage to kind of pitch the film to them, and were they reluctant to be involved? Did they know exactly what the film would be about, ultimately? Um, we we were very honest at the beginning, um, explaining to them that we wanted to be happening the story uh, from both sides, and um, it didn't really take that much convincing. Uh, they weren't very happy with the type of press they were getting and how they were being represented at that time. So I think they saw uh, a sort of long form film uh, to, as a way to kind of um, make their piece, say their piece. And uh, just sort of formed a trust based off of that kind of journalistic um, sort of ideals, and they respected that, and the towns people as well respected that we that we were going to be speaking with them as well. So, uh, kind of worked out that way. And was there any point when you were concerned at all for for your safety, or did you receive any retaliation from? white supremacists or people associated with Cobb after the film's release or while you were filming? Uh, while we were filming, we never really felt any in any danger. I mean, it was certainly um, tense and a lot, you know, you could feel that the sort of atmosphere of the town was pretty um, tense and everyone was stressed out and, and that sort of uh, affected us. But a lot of the the events like the armed patrol, uh, we were not there for. Um, so I, I don't know what that would have been like had we been there uh, when that armed patrol took place. That was that was a couple days after our first trip uh, when Cobb and Dutton went on that patrol and, and Deborah Henderson filmed it. Um, and then as far as after uh, the film, uh, we haven't really heard too much uh, from Cobb uh, or from the sort of white supremacist community. Uh, Cobb has actually not seen the film still. Uh, we haven't made it back to North Dakota since uh, finishing shooting at last May. Uh, we're planning a theatrical release there in the fall, so we're going to head back out, and that'll be when we can share the film with him. Uh, but, yeah, it's it's been pretty quiet, I guess, since we finished. But I think that's because a lot of people haven't seen it. Um, I there's a mix. Th there's a mix of footage that you both shot, and that the residents of Leith have shot. And we see in the film that the camera lens kind of becomes a tool of either intimidation or self-defense. You see Cobb holding up a laptop or a camera, and people holding up cell phone cameras. Can you? And that kind of becomes a, th a theme within the film. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, that's sort of uh, the sort of technology became the kind of first weapon of choice for both sides. Um, luckily, in this day and age, that helped us tell the story because we we weren't there in some key moments, uh, and everyone was documenting things on both sides. Uh, part of it was um, to protect themselves legally. Uh, both sides felt that they were being discriminated against or being threatened, so. They were trying to capture as many uh, scenarios as possible, and we were lucky enough to 
gain that material uh, to put the film together. Uh, but it's definitely uh, a strong theme throughout the film. Well, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. If anybody has questions that they'd like to ask, you can just raise your hand and pass the microphone around. Yeah, I'm just passing the microphone around, so here you go. Yeah, hi, congratulations on the film. Um, my question relates to the comment um, one of your interviews mentions in 2001, following 9-11, the government took their eye off the ball uh, in terms of domestic terrorism. Considering the number of events that have and, and murders that have taken place since, uh, has there been any change in the last few years, or is it still more outward looking in terms of terrorism? So as you saw in the film, uh, the happened uh, by Fraser Glenn Miller, that happened during production. Uh, and so that was definitely kind of a wake up call um, for the Southern Law Center. But also at the same time, these types of things have a kind of a track record. Every few years, something like this would happen. Uh, what most recently uh, in, in Charleston, I think, is a huge, was a huge wake up call. And um, from what I've been reading, uh, it seems like the FBI is getting more involved in tracking these people. There are all these reports coming out about how uh, the sort of network online is spread and how messages like that are spread. And these are the things that the Southern Poverty Law Center were talking, have been talking about for years. So it really seems like uh, hopefully these types, of, these types of people, these types of things are being monitored more on a sort of a governmental level. We just have another question, passing the microphone. <coughs> Thanks for a great film, it's uh, really good. I, I'm just intrigued by where, where do they get their money from? I'm sorry, we couldn't hear that. Um, the question was, do you know where, where Cobb and, and his network were getting their money from? Uh, we don't really. I mean, we when we asked uh, Cobb about how he was able to, um, you know, sort of support himself and make a living, he was a little evasive in his response. Um, you know, he mentioned uh, some family money as being, you know, partially responsible for sort of comfortable. But you know, I mean, those those plots of land that he was buying in Leith were, were very inexpensive when he was when he was buying them and he was working uh, for a little while near the oil fields uh, where people are, are compensated pretty pretty well so um, yeah as far as other people in that community I, I have no idea but uh, as for Cobb it seemed like he had some money from private he didn't really share and, and one thing to add is uh the, the national show, the NSM that you saw, the guy, um, they actually take due, membership dues, and they also make most of their money, it looks like, off of an online shop. So they sell white power music CDs, um, you know, swastika t shirts, flags, all these types of like items uh, that people source of revenue that we see uh, coming out of that movement. If I can jump in with another question, um, going back to, to Cobb and Dutton, we see some some scenes of them uh, with their families and, and with Dutton's children, and I was curious to ask um, if you saw how, how much the children were exposed to the ideology of white supremacy and, and if you think that they had any exposure to that, because we don't see that much of that in the film. Sorry, can you repeat the last part of it? I think Chris's cat just. Uh, <laughs> um, I I just wanted to ask if you if you saw um, as far as Dutton's family and the children that we see in the film, to what extent were they exposed to this ideology and and did it have any effect on them or what what was their relationship to this kind of web of events that was happening around them? Yeah, they the kids. 
the parents, Kynan and Deborah, told us that they didn't impose their ideology on their on their children. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time with them. Pretty much that interview that we did in their house uh, when Kynan's making uh, the cake, that was the only time that we were ever inside with them and, and really around the children. Um, and they they had been at school for half of the day and they came home and they were just eating the cake and kind of hanging out. And I mean, it was interesting. They were listening to music in the kitchen sort of while we were talking to their parents and they were like listening to like Lord or Johnny Cash or like just kind of like pop um, kind of stuff. But I mean, at the same time, uh, you know, you see in Leith in that footage that they shot with the cell phone, you know, there's, there's a big flag with a swastika up in the house and the kids are all kind of, you know, reading in front of that. So, um, you know, I think that they definitely had a sense that they were outsiders in a way. Um, I mean, they had to leave Leith and they, they had to go to this other town and their father was in jail for a while. Um, so, I mean, I think it, you know, it's hard to deny that there's going to be some kind of impact on them. Um, but as far as the ideology, all we saw was we never heard the parents directly talking to the kids. Yep, I'm just passing the microphone to another audience member. Hello, I'm John. I'm a psychologist and I've got a specific interest in trauma and how certain people, adults with extreme views, are theoretically linked all the way back to children, the children they used to be having been abused, to the point where they can develop different personalities, such that these personalities can exist independently of each other, and possibly where they actually don't know of the existence of each other. So a couple have been a contrite and apologetic cop in court and the guy who couldn't help himself but find a good reason to go armed around Leith and the one that would have been almost the, uh, the neutral observer of his and his own society's view of life. And of course he could be just one bad guy through and through. He knows all about these personalities and all these things are acts. So I wonder whether you had any sense from the contact you've had with him, whether you were interacting with different people in the same person, or whether it was just one bad guy with a whole series of acts to perform. So it was it was kind of hard to hear, but I think is your main gist of the question uh, the sort of duality of Cobb in court versus Cobb um, showboating? Yeah, let's let, let's simpl simplify it to a duality. It's possible, theoretically possible, in my field, for an abused child to split their personality, such that when they develop into adults, they can switch between depending on circumstances. So I'm curious about whether you detected a guy that was apologetic to get himself out of trouble because he knew what he did, or whether there are two characters quite independently trying to survive whatever the situation they were involved in. Pretty interesting. Um, I think we definitely, s it would be easier to say that uh, the first scenario was true, but at the same time, um, stuff that wasn't included in the film, he would tell us, you know, how if he didn't get out that that time, he didn't know how long he'd last. Um, he, he did try to kill himself in jail. He went on a hunger strike um, and um, did that. And so it's very interesting. And his, sort of tr his whole childhood, he tells us about um, getting in violent fights with his father and being thrown into the military. So it seems like they're with some trauma in his life, and um, and you definitely see the split personality with him. Whether it's um, two people, or or if it's uh, done by sort of uh, circumstances, I'm not sure entirely. 
I believe we have uh, one or two more questions from the audience, so I'm just passing the microphone now. Hi, guys. Um, I was just wondering what the wider response was from the sort of white supremacist community. So did you have any sort of like negative feedback at screenings? Has it sort of documentary been flagged up on their forums? I was just wondering what the wider response is. Have you had any sort of like threats or anything? Uh, there haven't there haven't been any threats. I mean, there's been uh, the community, or at least the some of the internet community that that's come up um, when when I've Googled "Welcome to Leaf." Um, they're aware of it, and, and there is uh, a sense that the film is being tracked um, in some of these uh, some of these websites that that are introduced in the film. Um, so. Yeah, and we know Cobb, Cobb obviously has been, uh, you know, he's, he's aware of, you know, every festival the film plays, and uh, he's aware that, you know, it's been, it's been fairly well received critically. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely, I think, some anticipation uh, for a lot of these people in this community to see the film, but yeah, we don't, we haven't received any, any threats uh, thus far. We, we did screen... Uh, we did screen in, in hot dogs in Canada, and although Mike and I didn't witness this, uh, apparently a pro uh, one of the programmers told us that later that night that three people walked out at the end of the Q&A wearing swastika armbands. Uh, they didn't make a peep, and we had no idea they were there, but uh, so that was kind of an interesting uh, experience, even though we didn't really see it, but kind of li learning about it later that night. So we don't know, you know, they didn't say anything, so it's, it's hard to tell uh, what their reaction was. But they stuck through the film and a Q and A. So, were there any last audience questions? Yes, right here. Uh, thank you for your work. Um, it was particularly interesting to me. I grew up in the Dakota region, in South Dakota, actually. Um, and these uh, super small communities are particularly interesting, I think, because of the lack of resources with issues like this. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, if you felt that they were ill-equipped to handle the situation and if you felt like they didn't get the support that they needed from, uh, from the, the, um, the county government, the, um, the state government, et cetera. Yeah, I think if you, if you asked, uh, you know, Ryan or Lee or Greg, uh, they definitely felt pretty um, helpless in a lot of circumstances because, uh, you know, law enforcement wasn't able to do a lot. Um, they just tried to keep the peace, obviously, and, and Cobb and Dutton, they weren't doing anything illegal up until that, that patrol. Um, so yeah, there was definitely a sense that, uh, you know, they didn't have the resources to deal with it. There was talk at one point of dissolving the town into the county, um, and had that happened, then there would be no local town government that Cobb could take over. Um, and that is something that Ryan Lee and Greg and some other people in Lee felt like the police officers wanted the town to just do. So it would just, the problem would sort of go away. Uh, but they decided not to dissolve the town because they didn't feel like they'd have much, you know, say in the government because they were so small. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there was a lot of frustration. I mean, Ryan, the only thing they really had to decide every year, um, you know, as a government was when to put up the Christmas tree lights. Um, and sometimes there'd be like a barking dog that they'd have to sort of deal with. But uh, their whole sort of world um, and responsibilities changed pretty quickly. And I don't think anyone was prepared for that. Yeah, it was kind of a crash course for them in governmental procedure. They even had to hire an attorney, Dan, which is uh, Bismarck. Um, who came in and helped them figure out the the full ordinance situation because the ordinance had, hadn't been updated since 1915. So the whole running water thing up, that's how they kind of figured it out. This, this lawyer helped them out. So uh, it was definitely kind of a, a big wake up call. And especially, you know, in these, these small rural, rural areas don't really have to deal with these types of things. Just as a closing question, um, have there been developments since the film was finished? We see at the end that some people called, sold land to, I believe, still owned the land. And um, do you know what's happening in Leith now? Is it, are 
people living in calm. Yeah. Um, so Cobb is actually uh, attempting uh, a similar thing in another town um, as of a couple weeks ago. Uh, he's in a town called Antler, North Dakota. Uh, that's just it's right near the Canadian border. Uh, I think it's I think maybe 30 people live in that town, um, and he sent out sort of his intentions to the to the local media. Um, and so uh, this member members of um, the city council and Leaf are actually traveling tomorrow um, to that town, and they're going to have a big town hall meeting, I guess, like outside in a park with the residents of Antler, um, with the local sheriff's department and with several residents from Leith, giving them sort of their input on what happened uh, with Cobb. So that's, that whole thing is sort of happening again in a different place. Although, I, as far as I know, Cobb doesn't own a lot of land. He's trying to raise money um, and get interest using, you know, these websites. Um, but yeah, in Leith, there's definitely a lot of sort of bad uh, bad feelings, I guess is a good way to put it. Uh, Ryan is actually getting, um, he's fighting a misdemeanor charge uh, October 1st um, for one of the, the vi one of the burns. He burned another property that uh, we didn't, we weren't there to film. Um, and it set fire to a, a, a property that was adjacent to a, a couple's house and they're they're charging him uh with a reckless burn so you have these sort of conflicts in the very in a very small town so it's obviously uh you know it's it's kind of been torn apart in a lot of ways so so ryan is facing that that charge um and i think there's still the constant threat uh you know that these properties are owned by by people that are well-known white supremacists and if anybody wants to learn more about the film or, or see what other screenings are coming up or to, to arrange a screening, what would be the best place for anyone to look to find more information? Sure, we have, uh, we have, a, we have a, a US distributor um, and their first run features. Uh, so that's just their website, firstrunfeatures.com and then they have Welcome to Leaf page. Um, and then uh, Metrodome is our uh, UK distributor, um, and they they also have a website that they'll be updating with information about our UK uh, release. And then we have a book, uh, Welcome to Leaf Film, um, where we try to keep up and post everything that we're doing. Well, thank you both so much for calling in, and congratulations on Hot Docs and most recently East End Film Festival. So thank you very much, and thank you everyone for coming. Thanks so much for coming out. Thank you.